So what was your most memorable experience serving as president of the ASDS? I had the privilege of being the president at the 25th anniversary of our society. And as you probably know, we have presidential prerogatives. So I got to pick the thing that I most wanted to happen at the society meeting. I picked fireworks over the ocean at Hilton Head. It was fabulous. It was just fabulous. And the other thing that made it very special was many of the founders were still alive and came to the meeting. So we had the opportunity to recognize their unique contributions to our society. I remember those fireworks, and I remember, wasn't it John Scalgi and uh, John Yarbrough remember playing played, pian doing right? pianos, which was spectacular. It was spectacular. It was magical. It was. <clears throat> that was my first ASDS meeting, I think. Yeah. What were the issues that were facing the society at that time? In 1994, the society had just been seated in the AMA House of Delegates. We needed to establish our position within the House of Medicine. And as a newcomer to the club, it was very important for us to be seen in a positive way. So our first resolution was restriction of indoor tanning. And by putting on the white hat issue, we represented those who could not speak for themselves. Now, as you may recognize, indoor tanning is largely a woman's issue. So it was my privilege as the first woman president of the ASDS to put this forward to the AMA House of Delegates in their first resolution they ever dealt with for indoor tanning. I mean, just think of where that's come since that time and how much that pushed it forward. It's amazing. That's a very good example of what working within an organization can do. Because the organizations in the House of Medicine came together across the aisle. The pediatricians joined us. The oncologists joined us. And together, we worked for 20 years to make a difference, to restrict access to indoor tanning to minors. For the first time, we have seen a drop in indoor tanning. Now, that has not made a difference in the incidence of melanoma yet, but 20 years from now, it may well do so. Oh, for sure. What were the most significant innovations in dermatology at that time? We're going back a few years now. The significant innovation at that point in time was tissue expansion. Many of our members may not even remember what tissue expansion was, but basically, you put a balloon below the surface of the skin and you pumped it up to spread the skin and then you cut out whatever it was adjacent to and you spread that piece of skin over. So it allowed us to do reconstructive procedures that would otherwise not have been possible without grafting. That was a big advancement. Um, looking over your career, do you have a most memorable patient you want to share? Well, we're in Chicago. I have been based in Chicago for most of my academic career. So I'm going to give you a little South Side Chicago story. I had an Irish American male patient who had spent his summers doing what was known as getting a South Side tan, which was burning on the beach until you couldn't burn anymore. So they would do, go out, burn, and then put on a wet t-shirt that night until they didn't burn anymore. That was the way they lived their lives. This was before sunscreens existed. So I had taken a melanoma office back, and we were at our two-month follow-up visit, and I was beginning to do my patient education spiel about the need for early detection of melanoma because he could develop another one. I was about to launch into my features of melanoma when he stopped me in typical fashion shirtless, by the way, okay, he says to me, Doc, stop, I don't do any of that stuff. I looked at him and I said, so who does do that stuff? He says, my wife takes care of all that Doc stuff. I said, where's your wife? She's in the waiting room. I said, go get your wife. So he walks out to the waiting room with no shirt on, <laughs> drags his wife back in again. I begin to go through the spiel with her. She's engaged. She wants to make sure the thick-headed Irishman lives, okay? And that's exactly what she says to me, all right? So she, get, she gets it. She's got B, C, D. She's got the whole thing. At that point in time, we were on A, B, C, D. We hadn't gotten to E yet, all right? So they go away. I don't hear from them. 
She drags him back again, 18 months later, and points to a lesion on his back, not the same one, remote, another new primary, and says, I don't like that one, Doc. And she's right. She started me on a research endeavor that has lasted my team 15 years with external funding on the importance of partner-assisted skin self-examination and the role of the partner in promoting and sustaining the behavior. And it has been a fabulous road. What the team has been managed to do over this period of time is have a rigorous skills training program that educates the patient and their partner. By the way, the partner does not have to be a romantic partner. Now we've got it so that it's your skin check partner because not everyone still has a romantic partner at certain points in life, as was pointed out to me by a number of widows. So we now have skin check partners. We have proven that they can be accurate as compared with a dermatologist and that they can find new melanomas. Uh, it's, it's been really an extremely rewarding and great ride for the team. That's great. So important for the early detection. I remember a yeah, study probably not too far from that time period where they showed, I think, um, wives found 20 to 23 percent or something like that of melanomas on their husbands, <clears throat> and husbands found, I think it was 2 percent of melanomas on the wives. The gender differences in caring for each other and the health issues of who takes charge in the family are really important. But one of the things that the physician can do is empower the husband to be able to do that kind of caring. And I have literally brought the husband into the room with the wife and brought him behind the wife with me and said, look at this with me. And then when he gets it right, I pat his little hand and I say, good job because it's very important to boost up the person who's feeling insecure and is really charged with a rather large responsibility of trying to find a melanoma on their loved one. And we can empower that. And men can learn to do this just as well as the women can. <laughs> That's good. Education is key. Uh, and looking back at your career, is there anything that you would change or have done differently? I would have begun a fitness program earlier in my career, in about the 30s. And those of us who are surgeons frequently are in what's called a locked-in position at the table. We don't move enough. We can be there 10, 12 hours a day. We're not using our muscles and our joints appropriately. So I would have started to do yoga and Pilates when I was in my 30s, and I think it would have made a difference. I remember you talking about Pilates early on, before I even knew what Pilates was. You were <laughs> recommending it. Um, what advice would you give to today's young dermatologic surgeons? I think the most important thing for the long career that we have is find your passion, find it early, and then go with it. Because whatever the passion is that makes you want to get up and go to the office in the morning is what will sustain you through the extremely burdensome aspects of clinical care and the rigmarole of all of the regulations we have to endure. Good advice. And what are your predictions for the future of our specialty? I think all surgical specialties will be burdened with proving in an evidence-based manner the quality of the procedures and the way in which it changes the lives of the patients they care for. This is an extremely hard task because each of us has different technical abilities and to be able to design the research studies to sort of not have the confounding variables of the individual provider involved is going to be a huge task. It's one in which I think the ASDS can exert some leadership, but it is no longer enough for us to say we're wonderful. We have to prove we're wonderful. Perfect. What advice do you have for the ASDS leadership in serving its membership? All of us who take on leadership do so for our own private reasons. I think it's important for the leaders to recognize what their reason is for taking on the leadership. Mine was always advocacy. It was very simple for me. But that's not true of all of the leaders. And then I think one has to sit down and take a good look at the society and say, where is the mission of the society at this point in time? And if you're 
advocacy issue or your personal issue does not align with the mission of the society, then don't jump in. Find another place to go. If you find that it's a great match, jump in and then work to reach out to develop a program, excite enthusiasm for that program amongst the members, and carry it forward. Presidents have to make sure that whatever the problem, program is they start has legs so that it can continue into the future. Otherwise, you're a one-shot deal. Okay. Can we do one off script? Sure. <clears throat> so just thinking back over your career, you've had, or you've had so many accomplishments, done so much. Is there any one that sticks out in your mind that you're most proud of? Because I've chosen to stay in academics my whole career, I've had the opportunity to reach out and remake myself every decade by whatever was going on within that institution and tap the talent that surrounds me. So basically every decade I've had a what I'm most proud of. Uh, at this point in my career, uh, I would have to say it's being the editor in chief of what was once Archives of Dermatology and is now JAMA Dermatology. Um, I've had a very long run. It's more than a decade. And during that period of time, I've had the opportunity of watching our young researchers grow, put the reviewers to work to help them move to the next level. We've also developed what's called patient pages, which are basically graphic examples of diseases and their treatment for people who are illiterate. And we have a big problem with adult illiteracy in this country. Those are free. They're downloaded worldwide. You don't have to be able to read English to understand them. It's the most downloaded PDF file across all of the AMA publications. We've made a difference. We have people who know that their diseases can be treated because they've looked at a picture.